Hyman's Distinguished Visitor for the Fields Program, and he will speak on NIP and approximate subgroups. Okay, thank thank you, uh, Rahim. Thanks, to, yeah, thank you to the Fields Institute for uh, inviting us, and we I, we arrived last week. It's actually very nice here to be in person, meeting people again in per, in a in person conference, in person conference with people with other human beings around, and uh, you know, hopefully more. Hopefully people will just, it's a very pleasant environment here. Getting into Canada, you have to do some things, you know, as because it's, but getting once what one's here, it's a very nice place. And uh, those of you who plan to come here, you know, when you feel comfortable, but when you feel comfortable to come, uh, it will be nice to see you, everybody. Okay. So uh, what else, what else I want to say? What else do I want to say? Uh, I want to say something else. Uh, I wanted to say something else. Uh, yes, so uh, yeah, so I'm talking about this this topic, NIP approximate subgroups. Uh, it's work with. In fact, I can just. Uh, uh, good. By the way, can can you see me or just my screen? What what, what is seen by anybody? Both. Or, you see me too. Yes. Oh, the whole, the whole body, the whole what? What do you see exactly? The face. Face. Okay. Okay. Just, just, to, just to know if I should sort of, you know, whatever. <laughs> so this, this, this is work with Gabe, Gabe from 2020, from last year. I did give a talk. Gabriel gave several talks about this over the past year, I think, and I gave gave only one, only one talk, which was in Oxford under Oxford Logic, and Combinatorics uh, Day in uh, last a year ago and uh, it was also by Beamer and I rewrote I rewrote the slides a little bit because partly because I was uh, there was a talk by Julia Wolf in the ASL meeting in June I don't know if people saw were in part of that ASL meeting which was actually a Notre Dame meeting but online remote and uh, Julia gave a, a talk around the similar themes now and it really in, influenced me how to present things. So I'm presenting things a bit differently, partly just giving more background, influenced by, by Julia. Julia Wolf, who's uh, one of the combinatorics people we have some contact with. Uh, so this is what it's about. It's about a structure theorem for a finite, Taking my glasses off, it's better. Okay, for finite DNIP, DNIP, K approximate subsets A of arbitrary groups. That's just the words. Okay, and I'll we'll explain a bit later uh, things. So this is a mixture of approximate subgroup theory, Briar, Green, Tau, Hushovsky, and what we call tame arithmetic regularity theory, which is. Uh, which recently has been worked by, by Gabe Conan, myself, Caroline Terry, and Julia Wolf. I should actually, sorry, I should mention here, yeah, I should mention here too, it's also influenced by a recent paper by Amador Martin Pizarro, so it's Martin Pizarro, one name, Palestine, Daniel Palestine, and Julia Wolf. In fact, in fact, about stable, in a stable approximate subgroup context, in fact, they get. In fact, I think Amador or Daniel gave a talk about this in over Wolfack in January 2020. It seems like either yesterday or 10 years ago. I don't know. The whole timing is completely strange now. But was the, the last conference I was really in was January 2020, and they, he gave a talk that we started working on an NIP version, and that's the, this is the consequence. Uh, as in uh, Conant Pili. Conant Pillay Terry one and Conant Pillay Terry two. These were about stable, stable arithmetic regularity, NIP and arithmetic regularity, and, and Hushovsky's work on approximate subgroups. The proof methods are pseudo finite and use generalized stability, generalized stable group theory. People use the word neo stability, you know, but I don't like it. So I call it the place of neo, I say generalized for several reasons. Okay, mm. generalized stable group theory. Uh, so what I'm going to do is first discuss background and set the scene by looking at several uh, contexts or regimes. The word regime I first used in mathematics. I, did we use that very much the expression regime? I first thought it Barry, Barry Mazer somewhere in 
regime. So I'll talk about two or three regimes, but I'm not going to mention Mussolini. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. So, first regime or context is graph regulation. So this is just background of set setting the scene for the kind of objects that we're thinking about and the little bit of historical background. So I'm, I won't give full historical background, but I'm just going to discuss some of the basic themes. So graph regularity. So we first, graph regularity is about finite, and I'll say bipartite graphs. So there's two, store, there's two vertex, vertex sets, VW, and the edge relation R. So, so it's just sets, V, W, finite sets, and R is simply a subset of V cross W. That's the edge relation. Okay, two vertices are connected by an edge if they're in the relation R. Now, Semerady regularity lemma says, it's interesting because it says something non-trivial non about all finite graphs, right? It's, if you think about it, can you really say anything non-trivial non -trivial about everything, everything, right? So this is either theology or it's Saron Shella. <laughs> Does it say something about everything? But anyway, that's what it's about, to say about everything, all finite graphs. And the statement, informal statement, is that you can that there are partitions V, or V1 to Vn of V, and W1 to Wm of W into a small number of pieces, such that almost all, can you still see me? All right, yeah? I mean the other people, yeah? Such that almost all of the, you look at a VI and a WJ and you restrict the R to those two things. So you get another graph, some induced subgraph, VI, WJR. These are almost, almost all of them are regular in the sense that sufficiently large subgraphs of these people of, so what, what am I doing? What am I doing? Uh, yeah, sufficiently, sufficiently uh, uh, large subgraphs of VI, WJR, each of those have almost the same density, graph density. This is the informal statement, which I think is conceptually quite clear, except what it, what's almost all mean, right? except for that. So, so the notions of small, almost all, sufficiently large, etc., depend on an epsilon given in advance. And what is that? Well, more precisely, for every epsilon, there is an epsilon such that so, so the quantifiers are important, but you know, but we are, we in logic we can deal with quantifiers at least. So for all epsilon, there's an n epsilon, a, a number, such that for all finite graphs v w r, there are partitions of v w as above into at most n epsilon pieces. Oh, and there's also there's also this uh, sigma. There's a certain collection, sigma, of uh, pairs ij, such that for all ij, not in sigma, and the condition on sigma is that the collection of vi cross wj for ij in sigma is small compared to the size of v cross w, right? So the except this is sigma is the exceptional set of pairs of vertices, and it's small. Right for almost so for all ij not in sigma, viwjr is epsilon regular, and epsilon regular means for every subgraph, for every let's say vi prime, wi prime subset of vi subset of wi, such that the condition is that uh, epsilon such that the, what such that the cardinality of vi prime cross wj prime is greater as epsilon vi cross wj. So for large enough subgraphs, the difference between the densities of vi wj and vi prime wj prime is less than epsilon. The density of a graph is the, is the number of edges divided by the number of possible edges. Okay, so it's size of r divided by vi cross wj. Hopefully this is this is separation regularity theorem lemma. Is that okay? Good. So uh, that's so I've given I've I've said it right. That's the statement, and there be there are various versions of this. I mean, there's a nice treatment by Tao and Green 
of the generalization from uh, graphs to functions. So you can think of a graph as a bipartite thing or something, and there it is. And for any two vertebrae, an, an A and a B, you get yes or no. They're joined or not. Is it, if given A and a B, you get a number instead. A, so a functional version of similarity of regularity. Uh, a nice paper of Green and Tell. I think it's in the in a volume for uh, Semiredi. I think I forget. Okay. Uh, now I want to go continue. Now we also. I'm going pretty slowly here. Sorry. What now we can also talk about tame graph regularity when we when we when attention is restricted to those finite graphs which emit a fixed finite graph G. Okay. So you look at just. Not all finite graphs, those which emit a fixed finite graph G as an induced subgraph. So two special cases. G is the D half graph. One to D, one to D is the, the, the two same vertex sets, but treated formally separately. And the uh, graph relation, I is, related, I is related to J if and only if I less than equal to J. So this is the the class of destable graphs. When I talk about things like stable for graphs, I mean stability of the relation, not of the theory. Okay. That's one thing. Now for arbitrary, I can look at this is this is a special half, a special graph, the D half graph. Uh, now for an arbitrary emitting an, for an given a fixed graph, emitting that graph implies the graph is DNIP for some D depending on G. So it's interesting that if you start thinking about the class of finite graphs emitting a fixed graph, you're in the context of DNIP graphs for some D. And so NIP in includes the notion of emitting it some graph, okay, which is a, a natural thing for combinatorial people. In any case, under such restrictions, one obtains better conclusions in Semiredi regularity lemma with. Uh, homogeneity replacing regularity and homogeneity of a graph means a complete or empty and of course you could talk about epsilon homogeneity okay so in, uh, and homogeneity implies regularity epsilon, epsilon homogeneity implies epsilon regularity so the strengthening in, in all these things whether you talk about distal regularity stable regularity nip regularity theorems you're replacing regularity by homogeneity Okay, which is a, a, a strong and sometimes no exceptional set. That sigma doesn't, is not there anymore. Now, among the model theory references, so there, 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 are, there, there are a lot of people worked on doing this stuff in co combinatorics worked on, on, they also work with VC dimension, you know, v, VC dimension, and they do this stuff, but the model theory back, uh, references are Chernif, um, Maliar Estela, who initiated this stable regularity, Chernikov Starchenko, who worked on nib regularity and distal regularity. And then I, I wrote an expository paper, largely expository, which appeared in BSL last year, called Domination and Regularity. And I wanted to, and I give a few set different proofs of these things. And I wanted to make a certain, a certain point, which I think is a, an important point to make, uh, is that view, viewed through a certain lens or from a certain way of doing the proofs, these results or these tame regularity results for graph regularity are not so much about applications of model theory, but are restatements of model theoretic theorems. Modulo a certain kind of going back and forth between finite, which I call the pseudo finite yoga. So modulo a certain technique of going from finite to pseudo finite and back, which is completely routine. It's not, it's, it's just, at now it's routine non-standard analysis. Modulo this, or in, in fact, when you try and extend to continuous logic situation, maybe it's, it's not so routine, but, but at, this, at this level, it's kind of now routine. Uh, modulo that, there are just simply structural theorems in stability theory, which like stationarity of types or whatever, or stable local, local stable group theory, which simply you translate become exactly the combinatorial theorems about finite graphs, whatever. Okay, this is the interesting. Uh, so I think I made the point. <laughs> Did I get the point across? <laughs> uh, okay, arithmetic regularity. So 
The first regime is graph regularity. Second regime, arithmetic regularity. So here, instead of all finite graphs, we're interested in all pairs. So you want to say something about all finite graphs. Here you want to say something interesting about all pairs, G, A, where G is an arbitrary finite group and A is an arbitrary finite subset. Subset, which subset of a finite set is finite, or an arbitrary subset. I just want to say something about A, okay? Arithmetic regularity. Notice that from this setup of G and A, you actually recover a certain bipartite graph G. A bipartite graph, not G, a bipartite graph, where both vertex sets are G, and where the relation holds between X and Y, if and only if X times Y is in A. So when you recover from such a pair, a uh, bipartite graph to which Semiradi regularity applies. And in this situation, in, the, in this arithmetic situation, it's natural to ask, for example, if the conclusion of Semiradi regularity, which means this partition of G and G into things, etc., if that conclusion holds in a way compatible with the group structure. For example, a strong form would be you find these VA, VIWJ, which are all cosets of a fixed subgroup H of G. And the, and the, you know, and the, so again, there's an epsilon there, and the, the uh, boundedness on the number of things in the partition turns into a boundedness on the index of the subgroup H. Okay. Uh, well, this, this, this is actually too much to hope for. It, it's not going to work. But nevertheless, arithmetic regularity in the form I described was initiated by Ben Green in a paper in 2006 in what journal? I don't know, maybe the Gaffer journal. Uh, but he just worked with abelian groups, only abelian groups, and he proved a, a Fourier, analytics, a Fourier anal analysis statement, which I still do not really understand, but in the situ in the special case in which G, you restrict your attention, you, know, you, can, you can also restrict your attention in all this stuff to a certain class of groups. Okay, so if you restrict your attention to the class of groups G, which is F2 to the N, two fixed in N moving, so five dimensional vector spaces over, so this is not the free group. It's not the free group, right? It's five dimensional vector spaces over F2. You do actually get star. You do get this nice form of, of, of semi-ready regularity with just looking at it a bit closely, you get. The situation of a arithmetic regularity theorem for all pairs GA, where G is not necessarily abelian, is open. And that's something which we were trying to think about for the past couple of years, uh, okay? Arithmetic regularity, oh. Okay, okay, number two, right. However, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going the wrong way, I'm going the wrong way. However, you could also look at the tame case of arithmetic regularity where you assume R to be that relation. So I've had this relation before R coming from A, where R, you could say, let's say R is destable or DNIP. So you fix this for all your, so now you're looking at all pairs GA, where A is DNIP or destable in the sense of the relation being, then in fact, you have strong structure theorems when G is not, when G is not necessarily abelian. And this is contained in the first, in the two papers with uh, myself and Gabe and Caroline, building on what uh, Caroline, Terry and Julia Wolf did in some special abelian cases like FP to the power N, okay? So you do get, and maybe I state what this is. For example, here's a, here's a statement in the, in the destable case. You're looking at, okay, for every epsilon, there's an n epsilon, such that for every finite pair, G A, G a group, where the relation X times Y and A is destable, you can find a normal subgroup H of G of index at most index bounded by n epsilon, such that E, A is essentially equal to a union of cosets of H up to a small error. 
In particular, you obtain star from the previous page in a very strong form, and there's no exceptional set involved. So th this is th this is the best of all possible. The, the best of all possible theorems is a, is, is a stable case. And you know, this, this actually, in this case, right, some of our theorems, we have, to, we have to have to prove some new structural results. This is simply a restatement of moduli the, modulo the pseudo finite yoga of the fundamental theorem of local stable group theory, okay, which has been around for some time. The more general DNIP case is more complicated, where H is replaced by a so-called Bohr neighborhood, and there's also an exceptional set. And this is in the paper CP, the second paper with Caroline and Gabe, and it's, uh, it's a more complicated situation. However, one should say that in all the conclusions, maybe I've got some numbers wrong here, in all the conclusions in this tame case, in fact, in general, Nothing really is just the, the nature of the, of, of, of the statements of the theorems is nothing non vacuous is said about A unless A is big. It's like a fixed proportion of the size of G, right? If, you look, if you're looking at all the groups G and A is, you, you can't say something about the A's, which as G gets bigger, get, stay the same size. You, you know, so for small A in the suitable sense, nothing is said, okay? So what about, so here, now, now the, the third regime, approximate subgroups regime, uh, what about making a statement about arbitrary, even very small subsets A of finite groups? Or once A is very, once A is small, G need not even be finite, it could be an infinite group. So what about the regime where you wanna say something meaningful about pairs G A, where G is an arbitrary group and A is a, an arbitrary finite subset. Okay, that's the, well, it's the pre-approximate subgroup regime. So it's reasonably clear that nothing can be said, right? At this level of generality, even assuming stable at NIP, other than A being a finite subset. You can't say anything more than the, than the assumptions. It's a little bit like in, it's a little bit like in, even in sort of model theory or stable group theory, you know, you take a stable group or something, and what do you, what can you say about arbitrary definable subsets of the stable group? Well, nothing unless it's unless it's like generic or something, right? It's got large stabilizer. You don't say it could be, you know, you could take a, or I could take something which which, which is a generically stable group, but underneath, low down, there could be all kind of stuff going on. So it's a, bit, a little bit like that model theoretic phenomenon. You could say not much. Uh, about a small thing in a large object, okay? So you have to make additional hypotheses in this case. And one natural hypothesis coming out of a line of research in additive combinatorics is that of an approximate subgroup A of a group G. So it's just, enough, it's, you know, there are pro probably there are other, in fact, there are, I mentioned several hypotheses which are, uh, but there are probably other things you, could, you, you, you can say, you know, but this is a nice hypothesis. So what, what's, what's that? So we define a subset A of a group G to be, it need not be finite actually, just a subset of a group G, fix a number K, by number I mean here inter, a positive integer. You fix a K and you call a subset A of a group G to be a K approximate subgroup if it's symmetric which means that A and its collection of inverses coincide. And if A times A, by which I mean, the, when I write A times A, I mean the collection of products, X times Y, X in A, Y in A. If the set of A times A is covered by K, translates, left translates of A, right? They, they, they write it by saying something like, uh, a times A is contained in P A, where P is of size uh, at most K. That's how people write it, okay? And this is the uh, approximate subgroup. There are some related conditions on A are uh, closely connected conditions, which actually will, will appear in the hypothesis of the theorem, are K doubling or K tripling. So a K, K tripling, for example, is that A is finite. So again, G here is an arbitrary group, but here A is finite. 
and this cardinality of a times a times a in the similar sense as before is at most k times the size of a and likewise a has k doubling if the size of a times a is at most k times the size of a and there are results about uh, uh, if you have a set with k tripling then something like a times a to the minus one is uh, is k prime proxima for some suitable k prime right there are results around this so there's a, a close a, there's a close connection between so in fact you know for a finite set k approximate implies k doubling and uh, and K tripling, okay, for abelian groups, K doubling implies close to a K approximate, and for arbitrary groups, K tripling implies close to K, K, approximate, K approximate after replacing A by A times A to the minus one, and adding maybe one identity element, right? So I don't want to go into these details, but there's a close connection between all these hypotheses. And uh, a, typical a typical example of a two approximate subgroup of Z is, of the integer Z is, minus n plus n it's obvious it's too approximate right you add it to itself you get minus 2n n it's size two times the original thing you started with okay a, a generalization of a, of this of this uh, thing is given by the notion of a generalized arithmetic progression it's uh, in z and freeman one of the first uh, an early result in arithmetic combinator arithmetic additive combinatorics sorry show that finite k approximate subgroups are closely related to initial segments of generalized arithmetic or parts of generalized arithmetic progressions so in fact you know minus n plus n is the first part of, of, of the of arithmetic progression one two three four okay so you generalize it to a, a segment of a of a more general progression which i'll define later and the notion of closely related means commensurable which means finally many translates cover each each covers the other one where there's a bound on the number of translates depending on some other data okay this was generalized by green and Rusha to arbitrary abelian groups in place of z using a notion of coset progression which takes into account the existence of finite subgroups of the of the group in question again i'll give some definitions later and finally in this big result of uh, Bruyard Green Tau, they extend this to the to not to not necessarily abelian groups. The notion of a coset nil progression replaces the coset progression. So the general theme here is that uh, these approximate groups or these these sorry these these sets which are finite approximate sets or finite sets with finite tripling or something are close to in a suitable sense highly structured things such as arithmetic progressions coset nil progressions etc that's the that's what right so in in caroline's talk she was talking about the takeaway that's the takeaway from this slide okay if you want to use that if i use that expression all right approximate subgroups three i didn't get very far by the way how like how long do i have i mean i, I, I mean not for, not not for the rest of the life but for now for this talk something like 25 really okay okay so this part of the talk is kind of is uh non-technical but i'll get onto a technical thing later which may take a bit more time but i'll see how i i don't mind not giving the whole talk because i'm going to communicate a few ideas let's compare the arithmetic regularity regime to the approximate subgroup regime in terms of conclusions okay in the former in the arithmetic regularity regime or context the structure theorem is relative to an epsilon there's an epsilon but not in the but not not in the arithmetic uh, context on the other hand in the arithmetic so, so not i'm confusing in the arithmetic regularity re context there's an epsilon not in the approximate context on the other hand, in the approximate context, the structure theorem is only up to commensurability, where x and y and g are said to be commensurable if finitely many translates of each of x, y cover the other. For example, suppose in the arithmetic, suppose in the approximate context that actually my group G is finite, not just R, but is finite, and in, and in my, and, 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 and I'm looking at only A's, subsets 
So I'm looking at a family of G and A, where G is finite, and A has the property that it's generic in the sense of a bounded number of translates cover the group. And that's, that's, that's already the conclusion. It's commensurable in a bounded fashion with the group itself. That's it. Right, so, so whereas in the, in the uh, arithmetic context, I was actually trying to say a little bit more, even if your subset A is generic in a uniform way in G, you still want to say something about A, <laughs> a bit more structural. A is something or other. A is actually maybe a subgroup or a coseless, you know, you want to say something more. So that's, that's the difference between the, but, but one difference between the two uh, contexts. Now, the improvement, now, the current talk is about mixing DNIP and approximate. So the improvement in the approximate regime, where you also assume A to be DNIP, which means the relation X, Y, and A is DNIP, is the structure theorem in terms of cosinal progressions is about A itself, not up to commensurability. Not up to some, you know, it's, it's about, a, it's a close, so, it's, so it improves in a, in, in a strong sense, the arithmetic, the, the approximate uh, 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 subgroup results of, uh, I think I'm mixing up arithmetic and approximate too much. No, no, I'm so, apologies. But there's still an epsilon involved. Okay. Uh, good. So, so we've got some time left. I'm gonna talk about the proof methods, the statements, things like that. Some of the definitions, and we'll see how far we get. Is the timing, is things okay? The timing okay so far in terms of comprehensibility? Does anybody have any, any comments or questions from the audience, from the remote audience? For example, Daniel Hoffman always has something to say. Daniel, you've always got a point, you've always got a point to make, Daniel. Maybe you're not there anymore. Maybe Daniel's not there, okay. So. Any, any questions? In fact, Dave, can, can people even hear me? I'm not sure anybody hears me. We can hear me. you. We can yes, hear you. You can hear me. You can hear me. Good. So there are pe people are there outside there. Okay. Good. Uh, so let's, let's just recall definitions, which, which we've given quite a few times in this talk, in, in, this, uh, in this conference. Uh, NIP, so M a structure in language L, phi X, Y, and L formula. X and Y could be tuples. Then the, then the formula phi X, Y is D nip with respect to the underlying structure M, ambient structure M. If they do not exist, A I for I, when, when I write D, I mean one, when I write, uh, I mean one to D uh, such that, uh, you can't find AI for I and D and sigma subset of and sigma ranging over subsets of D such that the formula phi, I, phi AI B sigma holds if and only if I is in sigma. This is D and IP for a formula. Okay, in a now take a group G and a subset A of the group, and we'll say that A is D and IP in G. If the quantifier free formula, so I'm working really with G as a group and times G times. A a subset, you think of A as given by a predicate, for example, if you want, if, uh, if the quantify free formula, X times Y and A is DNIP with respect to the ambient structure, G times A. Yeah, that's the structure. Likewise, we have the properties of destability of a formula phi X, Y. The same thing, but with stable in place of what we talked earlier about the, uh, the D half graph. Same thing, okay? And as mentioned earlier, given a, given a specific finite bipartite graph uh, G, there is some number D integer such that for any graph, finite, finite or infinite, it doesn't matter, which emits that fixed graph G, the formula X times Y in R is DNIP, where the relation, yeah, okay, where R is the graph relation. So again, Emitting a subgraph implies nip for a suitable number, right? Uh, Cosine nil progressions. A couple of slides 
just saying what a cosine nil progression is. So first of all, what's a generalized arithmetic progression? Take an abelian group and you uh, take an abelian group and excuse me, and by generalized arithmetic progression of rank D in G, we mean the image of a homomorphism from some D dimensional box in Z to the D, which means product of minus Li, Li closed. Li could actually be real numbers, but I mean, you, you, you know, bit, yeah, close doesn't make sense, it could be open. So it's all the things up to Li or minus Li. D take a D dimensional box in Z to the D and take a homomorphism pi from Z to the D to G, then uh, the image of that thing is called, the, the image of that is a generalized arithmetic progression. And obviously, what's it depend on? It depends on you take, uh, you know, the, the image, you have like, what do you have? You have one, 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 you have the point one, 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 one in Z to the D. You look at the image of that, of that, of that, and that determines everything. Okay, that determines everything. So, so the, uh, and you think about it, and it's, it obviously is a, uh, you know, it's part of a general, it's part of a, some kind of arithmetic progression. And such an object is actually a two to the d approximate subgroup, it turns out. Sorry, a typo with approximate. I don't mean approximate, I mean approximate. Two to the d, right? So that's a, a generalized arithmetic progression. Uh, properness of it means one, one, means pi is one, one. Now, one wants to take maybe account of finite subgroups of G. So what they call a coset progression of rank D is something of the form P0 plus H, where P0 is a generalized arithmetic progression uh, of rank D as before, D where that's the same D, and H is a finite subgroup of G. So by the, so by the way, if, you, if, you, if P0 is empty, then you'd have a finite subgroup. So this includes finite subgroups. Okay, I think I think in in, in literature sometimes they use uh, translates of progressions in place of this. I think, but Gabe, Gabe somehow wrote this stuff with this notation. Now the notion of a coset nil progression is a certain non-abelian generalization, where uh, in, uh, and where, where nil putting groups play a role, and. Uh, We'll see the role of nil and groups a bit later. But anyway, in place of the box above, we consider a box in the free, a box in quotation marks in the free nil and group of step R and rank K. So rank is the general, right? Free on K generator, the step R means R nil potent. So what is this box? It consists of elements. So, so let's take the generators as E1 to EK of this finely generated nil and group. And you look at elements of the group, of the nil group, which can be written as a word in the generators E1 to EK and their inverses, and where each of these EI and its inverse appear at most LI times. Okay, so that's gonna be the analog. So, so, so the data here will be R and K and L1 to LK. That determines the box. And now you again take a homomorphism from this box into your group G, and the image will be a coset nil progression. So it's the analog of the previous thing. And as I said here, that's why I say here, a rank R step S nil progression or step K, should be step K maybe nil progression, is the image of such a box under homomorphism to G. And there's an analog of properness, which they call C normality for a given C. This is a kind of properness for Generalized arithmetic progressions was a kind of an irredundancy state, of, you know, condition. And there's also the irredundancy condition here, which is called C-normality. I'm not going to talk about. Now, a coset nil progression is likewise, as in G is a set P, called P0 times H, the products, where P0 is a nil progression, as above, and H is a finite subgroup normalized by P0. So again, this includes just finite subgroups when P is nothing. Uh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Tell me what I'm doing. 
Okay. Oh, the end of the slide. I came to the end of the slide. That's it. Now I can give a statement of theorem. This is the theorem, but it's, it's a little bit. Okay. Question? Um, it sounds like there might be an issue with your sound. Let's just check. Uh, can you say something? Hello? Is this turned off? We can, can hear you. You're breaking up a bit. Breaking up a bit? I'm breaking up. Should, should, should I take, take this microphone? Let, let me take the microphone, okay? Uh, leave this here for now. Take the microphone. And, uh, Pardon? Oh, I know what I'll do. I, don't, I know what I'll do. I will look at. I will look at this. And, Dave, is it, is it okay? Yes, much better. Okay, I'm going to do it like this. So I'm going to, I'm, 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 I'm like standing up, looking at my own slides now, from like you are. Okay, so uh, I can't see it. Okay, so I'll be okay. So uh, the theorem is a little bit complicated to state, but I, but, but, but I mean, I've got at some point to state what the theorem is, right? I could just hand wave about. I've got to say what it is. So I'm saying it now. So, so uh, you take uh, again. This is ah. What do I use to highlight things again? The top one. Ah, good, 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 good. Okay. So you take a finite. This is the theorem. You take a. Out the theorem I'm talking about, the theorem which is the subject of this talk. Uh, you take a, a group, arbitrary group, and a finite subset. I'm assuming k tripling here, not k approximate, k tripling, which actually is very close to k approximate in the NIP environment. And you assume A has k tripling and D is D NIP in the sense I said before, the relation x times y in A is D NIP. Given epsilon, you can find a coset nil progression, P and G which will be a finite cosignal progression and a subset Z of A times P. But that, that means, right, you're multiplying A elements of A times things of P on the right, P on the right. And so P is finite and the size of Z, sorry, what? The size of Z is less than epsilon to the size of A. So Z is the exceptional set or the error set. And uh, such that, First of all, P is contained in A times A to the minus one, together with A minus, to minus one times A. So P is contained in that. And A is also contained in a bounded number of left translates. No, A is contained in, uh, no, there's a mistake here. A is contained in, uh, yes, it's right. A is contained in C times P, for some C of some some C contained in A, so A is what it means is that A is a uh, is contained in some finite number of translates of P, right by the element C. Moreover, so left translates of P. Moreover, uh, for some D in C, you look at D times P. What's that? D times P is just the union of the left translates of P by elements of D. So A, you look at A. So what I'm saying is that A equals D times P outside Z and up to epsilon times the size of P. So formally, the symmetric difference of A and DP take away Z is less than epsilon times the size of P. So morally, if you want to use the word morally in such ways, A is simply a up to epsilon. A is essentially a union of finitely many left translates of a coset null progression. This is the structure theory. Okay, so it's not, so, so there is some, of course, there is some commensurability, but it's just a unit of finite, a unit of translates of something, so this, of something structure. And now three is actually follows from two. And it says that, what it says that if you take any G moreover, if you take any G, uh, if you take any G in, uh, G take away Z for any translate. Look at the left translate of G of P by G. 
intersect with A, either it's very close to the size of P or very small compared with the size of P, which means that A intersects each GP, each transit GP, either essentially equaling it or in empty, essentially completely or empty. For each translate of GP of P of GP, each translate GP of P, either that translates contained in A or disjoint from A. Okay, so this is the I talked about, you know, th this is the group analog of complete or empty for the for the graph business. Okay. Good. Moreover, the rank and step a normal form of P and the cardinality of C are bounded by constants depending only on D, K, epsilon. If G is abelian, we can take P to be a coset progression, as we said originally, with, based on generalized arithmetic progressions. This is the this is the statement. Any questions? No. Uh, no, the K tripling hypothesis is a bit weaker than the approximate sum hypothesis, but it's essentially the same. Under NIP, under NIP, if you take a set with K tripling, then you take the set A and you join the inverses and one, you get a K approximate close to K, maybe the same K approximate sum, or maybe a slightly different K, but it's connected. Now, what about BGT? Is it supposed to be a version of a strengthening of B of what, what's the question on the chat? In a stable case, I'll mention it. I'll mention it as we. I'll, I'll say what it is right later. If I can get to it, I, I don't get to it. I'll say it anyway. Uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, in a stable case, right? Okay, let me even say it now. In a stable case, the in a stable case, P is a subgroup. In the stable case, I'll say it now. P is a subgroup. So if you can take P to the A. Pardon? If I don't you know. Take C to the A, no, okay, in fact, I think there could be a typo there. C is just a finite set. Oh. C is a finite, I, I don't know why I put, I mean, C is it, it, it's things you translate by, okay. you know. But in the case, right, so, so C is just, it just means A, okay, so in the stable case, there's no exceptional set Z, doesn't exist, there's no Z. And the statement is that uh, uh, A is simply a union of cosets of a subgroup, again, with the condition here about uh, in three, that, it, that, that, that up to epsilon, uh, that, that each, uh, yeah, it's, it's a union of cosets of subgroups of A, of cosets of H, up to uh, something of size, and most epsilon the size of h so you get much so who was that by who was who was the question from each i captain yeah is that okay each i yes yes thank you okay so yeah the stable and the stable case what was done by uh by uh, by amador and uh daniel palacine and julia right Comment on the statement, right? In the main result of BGT, of Bouillard Green Tau, there's no NIP hypothesis. So there's a, let's say, a, what I would sometimes call an NN NIP hypothesis, which is not necessarily NIP. Right? NN NIP. There's no NIP hypothesis, no epsilon. In the conclusion, there's no Z, there's no exceptional set. And in one, we have the weaker statement. That P is contained in A with A minus one to the power eight. And two and three are re replaced simply by saying that two and three, that, that you know, with, with, with the structural conditions on A being essentially a, a essentially a finite union of well-structured objects, is replaced by uh, A is covered by. So many translates of P. Okay, so that's that's the relationship between the between the uh, now the conclusions two and three above in theorem the conclusions two and three above. Uh, sorry, the conclusions two and three here 
are typical tame arithmetic regularity uh, conditions that outside a small exceptional set, A is essentially a bounded union of highly structured objects. In this case, translates of a coset real progression. When G is exponent R, in, even when, when G is exponent, fan exponent, you can, you can just condense, suppose G is fan exponent R, fixed exponent, the coset real progression can be replaced by a subunit. So if index depending on the data, etc. etc. Okay, as in the stable case, but there's an exceptional step. Now the proof is essentially a non-standard proof. Maybe you prove a single statement in a non-standard environment, which you could think of if you want as a saturated group equipped with a pseudo-finite subset with k triplet, etc. And a is D with respect to the pseudo-finite counting measure. You mean you work? Pardon? Yeah, I mean when I say AI, I mean D if I mean the relation X times Y. Uh, okay, I mean it's nice to think. I, I, I like to think of pseudo finite business as simply work in a context of a non-standard model of set theory, which thinks A is finite. It's a very nice way of doing sort of pseudo finite mathematics rather than occupants. I don't, I don't, I don't like occupants. Okay, uh, the use of model theory and logic has a couple of aspects. First, proving the relevant statement in the non-standard environment, and B, putting it down to obtain the theorem. And B is essentially routine. Part A is the main thing, but our current proof still involves going down here and there and appealing to Bouillard Green Tau. So we actually we call it ultra Bouillard Green Tau. It's what Bouillard Green Tau means in the non-standard environment. Okay, now. A, a few words about the proof, and, the, and, and, and this is this is an essential difference with with the arithmetic regularity techniques, is that one has to work at some point compact at some point in in, in tame arithmetic regularity, uh, compact groups turn up, comp Hausdorff groups to arise, uh, the, in a way that people who do model theory know, you know, by quoting by a bounded index sub. But uh, here it's locally compact, not compact, because one is working with, yeah, what, what do you do? Let's, let's say you take, so you take this big group G. So, you, so we're now in, okay, we're now in the non-standard environment, which you could think of as a group G, non-standard model of set theory, and that's a, 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 a finite at the center of the model uh, subset. And you look at the group, subgroup of G generated by A. So we're proving a single theorem here in this without any well, it's without much epsilon involved. Look at the group generated by A, a so-called V definable group, group generated in infinitely many steps. Now, if the group is generated in finitely many steps for some chance, then you're actually in the then the group H will also be pseudo-finite, and we're essentially in the arithmetic regularity environment. So the non the, but, but A is typically small compared to G. So there's no reason why it should generate a group in finitely many steps. So, so A, H is what's called a V-definable group, indefinable. It's a unit definable sets, which I write A plus minus M, A to the M, you A to minus M plus one. Each which is covered by finitely many translates of the approximate group A plus minus one. So you have A, replace it by A plus minus one together with one, it's an approximate subgroup for some K now, you see, K goes up in the ultra product. You've got approximation. Of, and then it's covering all these definable pieces of H in finitely many steps. So A, so A is actually generic in H. H is a V definable group. To be generic in H means every definable piece of H is covered by finitely translated. Uh, we take the pseudo finite counting measure, normalize so that the measure of A is one. Then this measure is less than infinity value to elements of. The, so look at R, the ring so-called ring generated by the ref left right translates of A. The ring means what? You take a set A, look at the left right translates, you take all the closed ended sections, finite unions, and complements within the set. A, a take away B or something, right? That's called a ring in what subject? I don't know, set theory. Something. Look at the ring. First, stabilize the theorem. There's a smallest bounded index R type definable subgroup gamma of H with gamma contains A, A minus one union. This should be a union 
this should be union a minus one a so it's a type definable r i mean using formulas in r bounded index uh, uh normal and type definable although h is v definable this h lives inside a definable set okay and uh h mod gamma with logic topology so this is is a locally compact group and we take the canonical subjective homomorphism from h to g so this is the gamma is like a g mod h mod h zero zero this is actually a locally compact group with logic topology where do you have to say what logic topology is i don't know i'm going to leave it for now Wait, leave it for now and the main use of nip is a generic locally compact domination theorem and this is the structure theorem domination theorem uh, uh, it's like compact domination generic compact domination is generic locally compact domination and let me state the theorem quick the, 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 the what the result is you take a har measure on the locally compact group downstairs we also have the measure mu upstairs okay, upstairs downstairs downstairs means image under the homomorphism and you take uh, let x be a set in r in my ring of sets and a good definable subset of h then you can find a closed set e in the downstairs group of, of lambda measure zero hard measure zero such that for every uh for every c downstairs you take or there's also yeah there's a close set z should be e e should be z so yeah z is the exceptional set you take a set a c downstairs look at its pre-image in the group h and then the pre-image uh either contains x or it's disjoint from x up to a notion of smallness of mu we call it mu wide all right so it's so this this is you see all the ingredients there of this kind of regularity stuff it's all there but it's in a the domination statement plus several more steps including appealing to ultra bgt yields the following non-standard version of theorem 0 0.1 which is the main statement and that would be i think i'm going to stop there okay which uh, suffices here's a this is the non-standard version of theorem 0 0.1 for any epsilon, so we're, there's an internal cosine nil progression P in normal form of, of in, inside uh, inside G. So we're upstairs. So notion of cosine progression makes sense in the non-standard universe. And there's a Z containing an AP a, with Z in your ring. The measure of Z is small and such that uh, P is contained in A a to the minus one in set union it should be i think a to the minus one times a a is covered by finally translates of p uh, and for each g which well, all the statements from before yeah 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 for each g in yeah okay a take away z so a you take a you you throw away z and you that it's a finite union of translates gp of p up to mu measure zero. So you so throw away things of, of measure zero and throw away Z, and this set A is simply a union of translates of a coset null progression upstairs. That's the statement, and that that comes down, that that gives that gives uh that gives rise to the that gives us our theorem in a in, in a standard in a standard model. Okay, and there's a few additional remarks, but I'm going to leave that there and stop for now. Okay, thank you.